Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week we will remember the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust and all those scarred by genocide since as we mark Holocaust Memorial Day. We must all commit across this House to defeat prejudice and hatred wherever we may find it. To work for a better future, we must find light in the darkness. I can also join the Prime Minister in wishing everyone a happy Burns night. Mr Speaker, Zara Alina was walking home from a night out with her friends when she was savagely attacked, assaulted and beaten to death. Zara was a brilliant young woman, a trainee lawyer with a bright future. Her killer is a violent, racist, woman-hating thug, not fit to walk the same streets. No. Yeah. But that's precisely the problem. He was free to walk the same streets. Yeah. The inspectorate report into her case says that opportunities were missed by the probation service that could have prevented this attack and saved her life. Does the Prime Minister accept those findings? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, this was a truly terrible crime. And as the Chief Inspector has found the failings in this case, and indeed others, were serious and indeed unacceptable. In both of the cases that are in the public domain, these, ca these failures can be traced to failings in the initial risk assessment, and that's why immediate steps are being taken to address the serious issues raised. Keir Starmer. I'm glad he accepts those findings. The report also says that staffing vacancies and excessive workloads contributed to those fatal failures. And it makes absolutely clear this was not a one-off. As the report says, these are systemic issues in the probation service. They're clearly ministerial responsibilities. Does the Prime Minister accept those findings as well? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, let me outline for the Honourable Gentleman exactly what steps we are taking, and that's to include and that's to ensure that mandatory training to improve risk assessments is being put in place. It's mandating checks with the police and children's services before a probation officer can recommend to the court that a convicted offender be given electronically monitored offence and implementing new processes to guarantee the swift recall of offenders. And the action we are taking is already making a difference, as, for example, we see in the reduction of the number of electronically monitored curfews being given by the courts. Mr Speaker, it was Barking, Dagenham and Havering that tragically and fatally let Zara down. But across the country, probation services are failing yeah. after a botched, then reversed privatisation. Yeah. Yeah. After a decade of underinvestment, yeah. it's yet another vital public service on its knees yeah. after 13 yeah. years yeah. of Tory government. Yeah. I spoke to Zara's family this morning. It's hard to convey to this House the agony that they've been through. Mm. They say that the government has blood on their hands over yes. these failings. Yep. He's accepted the findings of the report. Does he also accept what Zara's family say? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, my heart, of course, goes out to <laughs> Zara's family. He mentioned accountability. The probation services has taken action where failings have been found and where that has been appropriate. And with regard to the overall service, because of the extra investment we're putting in, there's now £155 million a year being put into the probation service so that we can deliver better supervision of offenders. There's also been an increase in the number of senior probation officers. But one of the other things we must remember, Mr Speaker, if we do want to increase the safety of women and girls out on our streets, that we need tough sentencing. And that's why this government passed the Police Crime and Sentencing Act, which the Honourable Gentleman opposite and his party opposed. In light of the case of Zara, I really don't think the Prime Minister should be boasting about the protection that he's putting in place for women. And I'm not going to take lectures from him about that. Does the Prime Minister agree that any politician who seeks to avoid the taxes they owe in this country is not fit to be in charge of taxpayer money? Yeah.
Well, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to make my position on this matter completely clear to the House. The issues, the issues in question occurred before I was Prime Minister. With regard, with regard to the appointment, with regard to the appointment of the Minister without portfolio, the usual appointments process was followed. No issues, no issues were raised with me when he was appointed to his current role. And since I commented on this matter last week, more information has come forward. And that is why I have asked the independent adviser to look into the matter. Now, I obviously can't prejudge the outcome of that, but it is right but it is right that we fully investigate this matter and establish all the facts. Mr Speaker, he avoided the question. I think any, anybody watching would think it's fairly obvious that someone who seeks to avoid tax can't also be in charge of tax. Yet, for some reason, the Prime Minister can't bring himself to say that or even acknowledge the question. Now, last week, the Prime Minister told this House that the chair of the Tory party had addressed his tax affairs in full and there was nothing to add. This week, after days of public pressure, the Prime Minister now says there are serious questions to answer. What changed? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I know know he reads from these prepared sheets, but he should listen to what I actually say. Since I commented on this matter last week, more information, including a statement, including a statement by the Minister Without Portfolio, has entered the public domain, which is why it's right that we do establish the facts. And, and Mr Speaker, let me, let, me take, let me take a step back. Let me take a step back. Now, of course, of course, of course, the politically expedient thing to do would be for me, would be for me to have said that this matter must have been resolved by Wednesday at noon. But I believe in proper due process. That's why, that's why I appointed an independent adviser, and that's why the independent adviser is doing his job. But the opposition can't have it both ways. The shadow leader, his, also his party chair, both urged me and the government to appoint an independent adviser, and now he objects to that independent adviser doing their job. It's simple political opportunism, and everyone can see through it. We all know why the Prime Minister was reluctant to ask his party chair questions about family finances and tax avoidance. But, but he, his, his, failure, his failure to sack him, when the whole country can see what's going on, shows how hopelessly weak he is. A Prime Minister overseeing chaos, overwhelmed at every turn. He can't say when ambulances will get to heart attack victims again. He can't say when the prison system will keep streets safe again. He can't even deal with tax avoiders in his own cabinet. Is he starting to wonder if this job is just too big for him? Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the difference between him and me is that I stand by my values and my principles even when it is difficult. When I disagreed fundamentally with the previous Prime Minister, I resigned from the government. But for four, but for four, but for four long years, he sat next to the member for Islington North. anti-Semitism ran rife when his predecessor sided with our opponents. That's what's weak, Mr Speaker. He has no principles and just petty politics. 